Well, it's an honor to have uh, my guest on today. I cannot tell you how uh, big of a fan I have been of your playing over the years, my man. And uh, I can't thank you enough for doing the show. Mr. Warren Haynes is here today. How are you, buddy? Good, man. How are you doing? I'm great, man. I, I got to tell you, uh, uh, I just watched this. Uh, of course, you have the Christmas Jam t volume 20 coming out, and you're about to do the 30th uh, anniversary of it. But I just watched this Dave Grohl thing, and wow, man. Yeah, uh, that's the only time he performed that live, that, that uh, creation of his called Play, which is like a 26-minute uh, instrumental. He recorded it in the studio uh, by himself. And then for Christmas Jam, he brought all his friends and all these great, amazing musicians from L.A. that came in and played it live for the first and only time. And it's fantastic. Oh, dude, it's it's like no quarter meets stranglehold. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I, I, I couldn't believe it. All I kept thinking was, I look, I love I love Foo Fighters, okay? But I wish that he would do more of that stuff because it was just insane. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, I love that that crazy instrumental stuff and all the odd time signatures. It's it's really cool. It really is because, uh, you know, I grew up on ACDC, Ted Nugent, Kiss, and then I start getting into the Allman Brothers, you know, and and then around, I think around 92, 3, whenever the Horde starts happening, the Horde tour and Jam really comes out into full force, you know. Uh, it really opened my uh, mind and also growing up around Primus in the Bay Area to, yeah. you know, alternative music. And then I start diving into Miles Davis. I start getting into, uh, you know, Zappa and all this outside the box music. And it's really all I really listen to these days, you know. That's great. Yeah, I I had two older brothers that turned me on to a bunch of outside of the box stuff early on. So I heard Zappa when I was really young and my oldest brother was into Miles and Coltrane and all that stuff. But, uh, and in, like most guitar players, I went through the whole fusion era where we were listening to, uh, you know, my Vishnu Orchestra and Return to Forever and Weather Report and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and some of it holds up better than others these days, but like Zappa, I think is timeless. You know, I don't think uh, you can improve on that. Yeah. Zappa, the dead, uh, Allman Brothers, you know, when you really get into those, because, you know, you there was that era of jam where it was just people just thought you just jammed and they forgot about songwriting, you know? Right. And, and that's the key thing. If you're doing Whipping Post without a jam, it's still a crushing song, you know? Yeah, the short version is great without all the jamming. But I think uh, what Government Mule tries to do, which is taking a cue from the Allman Brothers and, and from the Dead and from, from other bands, Led Zeppelin and stuff, is find that balance between songs and, and some special jam chemistry. Because one without the other is cool, but if you have both and you can strike a cool balance of the two, it's much more dimensional. Well, that's what I always loved about you, because uh, first of all, you are an incredible songwriter and you've been writing songs, you know, all the way back to when Garth Brooks did one of your songs. So songwriting has always been like one of your huge strengths, uh, along with, of course, your guitar playing and your singing. So it's like it's so important to have a great song at the end of the day. That's really why we're there, you know. Yeah, I, I love sitting and hearing someone play a great song on acoustic guitar as much as I love hearing some 20-minute jam that goes off the cliff, you know. Uh, I grew up listening to singer-songwriters, obviously starting with Bob Dylan, but, you know, even the more 70s stuff like James Taylor and Jackson Brown and all that kind of stuff. When I was 14 years old, I, I went through this phase where I studied all that stuff and it's so meaningful to hear somebody 
perform a song either stripped down or, or by themselves where you get the song in its entirety, but in a whole nother way, you know. Oh, God, that singer songwriter, you know, what was going on at the Troubadour in L.A. and that whole scene, Linda Ronstadt. It, it's it's just mind boggling. And then even when you get into the 90s and you start getting into the alt country of like Jeff Tweedy and Sunvolt and really bringing that stuff around. Uh, yeah, it's 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 like my favorite for sure. You know, I got the bridge on on uh, on Sirius XM. I'll listen to the bridge all day long. <laughs> that station, they just play yeah. singer songwriter stuff, man. That's great. Yeah. And, and I think any jam band, uh, in order to have some sort of staying power, you have to study the whole singer songwriter thing and, and include it in your list of influences. Otherwise, you know, jamming is, is great, but it, it can't maintain the attention span of, uh, of your audience if that's all you do, you know. Can I ask you uh, early on how you got involved as being a session guy? Because, of course, you're doing sessions, you're singing and stuff, and that's how eventually you start playing with Dickie and the Allman Brothers. But how did that happen? And was that something that you knew a producer that was bringing you in in, like, Asheville, or were you doing that in Nashville? How did you get into the session work? Well, I grew up in Asheville, which is five hours from Nashville. I, I knew I didn't, at that time, <clears throat> I didn't want to go to New York or L.A. So Nashville was the only uh, viable choice that was close by. I, I had, when I was uh, 20 years old, I, I had taken a gig with David Allen Coe, which was my first gig on that sort of level. Uh, and it was through him that I met Dickie Betts and Greg Allman, which would eventually lead me to joining the Allman Brothers. But joining his band, I was able to play on his records, which were produced by Billy Sherrill, who uh, did all the great George Jones and Tammy Wynette and Charlie Rich and uh, eventually Merle Haggard. But uh, Billy Sherrill also did those Ray Charles country records, which were fantastic. So I, I found myself with this open door. Uh, you know, it wasn't a shoe in. It wasn't like I could just start at the top. I had to go through all the ropes like anybody else, but I was young enough to be willing to kind of put up a fight. So I decided to move to Nashville when I was 22 or 23 and try to do session work there. Uh, the more I did it, the better I got at it. I actually got more work as a background singer than I did as a guitar player. I think a lot of the producers thought my guitar playing was a little uh, too much. <laughs> maybe, maybe not uh, Nashville prime time at that, at that point. Um, but as I worked more and more, I started realizing that I, I didn't really, I didn't really like it. it. It wasn't for me. I didn't want to be a chameleon. I wanted to be able to express myself uh, in more of a, a personal way. And then uh, I had gotten a call around 1986 from Dickie Betts saying that he wanted to put a band together and wanted me to be part of it and wanted us to write some songs together. So it all kind of just uh, exploded from there. You know, I, I worked with Dickie for two or three years. And then in 1989, uh, they called me and said, we're putting the Allman Brothers back together and we want you to join. And so at that point, uh, the whole world changed for me, you know. Yeah, and it it, it kind of changed for me, too, because then, you know, there's that dead period of no no Allman Brothers. And I was playing music at the time. And then the Allman Brothers come back and I go see you guys at the Shoreline. And it's just game changer because I'm like, oh, my God, here's a band I loved growing up. And they, you know, they were gone because members were gone and passed away and everything. And and also the music world had changed. And a lot of those bands like Dylan and Allman Brothers started playing county fairs and stuff. And it just dissipated. And then you come in with Woody and it, it completely explodes for years and becomes massive and incredible. And I call it the Soul Shine era, you know, the second set, all that live at the Beacon and stuff era. And it's just mind-boggling how incredible that band was 
with you two in there because it was a, a, a huge shoes to fill. And I think it was just as good. Well, it was uh, from the very beginning, the chemistry was really strong uh, with the new members and with the original members at that point being really on top of their game. They were all getting along together. They were uh, all playing and singing great. So from the very first rehearsals we did in January of 89, uh, it just sounded fantastic. And and all of us were kind of scratching our heads going, wow, uh, this is kind of too good to be true because the previous incarnation of the Allman Brothers was nine years early or earlier and they were trying to adapt to the 80s and trying to write songs for commercial radio and trying to update their sound and it just wasn't working. So as Dickie Betts told me, they just kind of backed out of the music business for a while. And then I think seeing the success of Stevie Ray Vaughan and Robert Cray on one side and the Grateful Dead doing huge uh, arenas and stadiums on the other side, uh, at some point around 88, 89, they started thinking, hey, somewhere in between those two things is us. Maybe there is a, a, a chance for us to kind of be ourselves again. Oh, man, it's, it, it was game changer. Absolutely. Up until that point, I don't really know your slide history, but I think you're one of the uh, one of my favorite slide players. Of course, a lot of people talk about Derek and and of course, the, the old days of Dwayne and stuff. But the thing I loved about your slide playing is it felt less erratic to me and it was more slippery, you know, it has slippery, beautiful feel. And I, I, you know, I just love your slide playing. Were you playing slide uh, way before that? Or did you start to have to learn it because the Allman brothers were happening? Well, I started playing slide when I was a teenager, uh, but I didn't focus on it as much uh, you know I was pretty good at it but but not great and then when I joined uh, David Allen Coe's band he had a pedal steel player so I didn't wind up playing much slide uh, if any in, in that band and then when I moved to Nashville I started focusing on it a, a lot more um, when Dickie saw me playing in a blues band uh, in Nashville I was playing quite a bit of slide guitar and he was kind of looking for that. So when he hired me to be in his band, it was the perfect opportunity and reason for me to really focus on my slide playing. So somewhere around 86, 87, 88, I started really buckling down and concentrating on slide guitar and, and realizing that I had kind of a, a different approach to it and a, a unique voice on it. So uh, playing with him kind of forced me in, into becoming a much better slide player. I'll tell you what, it's fantastic. I, 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 I'm, it's very pleasing whenever I hear you play slide, because like I said, it's just haunting and slippery. Uh, a lot of the slide players are a, a little too erratic for me, you know, that, eh, you know, and I like just sliding on in like the term slide playing, you know? Yeah. You know, I, one of the things that was different about my approach was that I was playing in standard tuning. Uh, I, I do play in open D and open G and uh, other tunings as well, but I, my preference is standard. And I think it allows me to be a little more melodic. Um, I, I copped a lot of stuff from people that were playing in open tunings and adapted it to, to standard tuning. Like Dwayne Allman played mostly in open E. Uh, the only two songs I believe that he played in standard tuning were Dreams and Mountain Jam. Uh, but I also listened to people like Lowell George and David Lindley and Ry Cooter. Uh, and most of those guys always played in open tuning, but there were people like uh, Rick Vito that played in, in standard tuning. I, I just did it out of convenience so I wouldn't have to switch guitars if I felt like playing slide you know um but it, it opened up a lot of doors for me to to kind of be able to think uh outside the box is not really the right expression but when you're playing in a standard tuning you're forced to think in that tuning 
Whereas uh, when I was playing in standard tuning, I could just kind of play whatever was in my head, which was a little more melodic. Yeah. I got a question that I've always wanted to know. Um, I went to the Fillmore Almond Brothers show and it was, I guess it was going to be the celebration of like a 40 year anniversary of uh, live at the Fillmore East. And I got to the show and I was, I remember I was at Soundcheck hanging out because I used to play the Fillmore a lot. So I was in Soundcheck and no Dickie. Dickie was supposed to be there. And then Derek showed up. Can you shine some light on what happened at that show? Do you remember that show? All of a sudden there was just no Dickie. He wasn't in the band anymore. Yeah. Um, that was a, a tribute to Bill Graham. Exactly. And, uh, that was at a time period when uh, the original members were not getting along so great. And we were in the middle of a tour and one day Dickie was there and the next day he was gone. Um, and we only had a few shows left. So we finished uh, those handful of shows and, and then went home. We wound up eventually doing six weeks without Dickie. We did three weeks with uh David Grissom playing guitar and three weeks with Jack Pearson playing guitar. Uh, but the show you're referring to, I, I think Dwayne Betts was also there, Dickie's son, uh, and Steve Kimmock came and joined us for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and we just made the best of it. You know, it was the first time we played without Dickie, but uh, it was a very memorable night and everybody rose to the occasion. And I, I've, good memories of the music that was made that night. It was great. It was great. It was just always a long question with me, like, wow, what happened? You know, Almond Brothers. Somebody just told me Almond Brothers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. It, it's it's amazing. Uh, I love your singing, and it's, it's, it's so wild to see you and Greg sing back and forth on, like, Soul Shine and stuff. Now, you played with him for years. Did you ever see Greg have a bad vocal night? Because I've never seen it. You know, he just was one of those guys that on his worst night still sounded great. Uh, you know, I've, I've obviously seen nights when his voice wasn't in as good a shape uh, as, as others. But he was one of my favorite singers my entire life once I started listening to really good music. His voice resonated with me and I, I learned a lot from him uh, before we ever met. And, and we met, I think in 1980 or 81, uh, you know, it, 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 he just had this uh, honesty about his singing. He didn't over sing, but everything he sang sounded like the right thing. And so for me standing next to him every night, uh, I, I learned so much that you can't learn from the records, you know. Um, and I think something about him singing his songs as well, it takes on this honesty that uh, is so hard for people to uh, obtain. But for him, it just kind of came natural. You know, he he listened to all the great soul singers and blues singers growing up. But he also loved uh, folk music and, and loved uh, Tim Buckley. He was a huge fan of Tim Buckley. And, and you know, Greg, we, we talked about Jackson Brown earlier. Greg and Jackson Brown were roommates in the 60s before the Allman Brothers. They lived together in L.A. when, when Greg was out there. And uh, so he's got that whole folky singer-songwriter side to him as well that that I just love when he's singing uh, softer and, and more melancholy. It's uh, just beautiful. Yeah. I, I mean, the first time I heard stormy Monday, that was, I was like, who's this? And then I yeah. was, in. you know, that was it. His voice was uh, a big Im influence on me. Uh, it's just mind boggling. I was listening to uh, the EP. What's the EP time of the signs. Yes. And your voice on times of the sign kind of sounds a little bit up in that Ian Gillen uh, range now, a, a little different than classic Warren Haynes to me. I was getting a little Ian Gillen flavor. 
I have I haven't thought of it that way, but I, I sure was a fan growing up. You know, uh, I, I loved those early Deep Purple records, and that's my favorite uh, incarnation of Deep Purple. Is that the one they call Mach Two? Yeah, uh, uh, I love that that version of the band. And uh, I actually sat in with them a few times in the past few years, and and it was cool, like playing alongside of Ian Gill and singing because he was at, at that time was still singing great. The band still sounded fantastic. Um, my voice in, in recent years is in better shape and I, it has more clarity than it had at certain times in, in my career when I was beating it up a little too much. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, man. Lack of sleep, a little couple all nighters. Next thing you know, you're way yeah. down the level. You know, we used to do like 13 shows in a row without a day off and, and stuff. And, you know, and back in the old days when you're singing and not carrying your own PA or monitors, you get one bad night with a bad monitor system and your voice is shot for weeks, you know. And uh, so I've through the years learned how to make, take better care of my voice and getting a lot of the clarity back, which allows me to, to kind of uh, sing hard, but not always have to be as gravelly, you know. Uh, I think most singers have two different voices. Their, you know, their soft voice and their loud voice. Uh, and for years, my soft voice had, it was just beat up so much that uh, I wasn't able to utilize it as much as I am now. Were you doing a lot of, uh, like, retraining it with, uh, like, vocal warm-ups and warm-downs and all that stuff? Yeah, uh, to a certain extent. I still don't do as much as I probably should. Um, but I find that the best thing for me is just singing every day. Uh, as long as I'm singing all the time, my voice stays in pretty good shape. It's when we take time off that it starts to kind of, uh, I don't know if relax is the term, but uh, you know, your, your voice is like a muscle, like any muscle. If you keep it in shape, it'll, it'll work for you. Um, but I've never been great at the warm up, warm down, but I, I'm much better at it than I used to be for sure. I got to tell you, uh, I, I, I love government mule and I went to, I flew out to see you guys at a voodoo fest years ago and, uh, Dave schools on base, I believe was on that night. And it, it like, those records from the first one dose all the way out are just unreal records, man. And the, and the live band is insane. I have not seen you guys in years because I've been touring myself, but can you run me down who is on uh, the bass now? And now you're four piece, correct? Yes. Uh, we became a four piece after Alan Woody passed away in 2000. Um, and we did the the deep end volume one and the deep end volume two recordings with uh, all Woody's favorite bass players, Jack Bruce and Chris Squire and and John Entwistle and Larry Graham and and Bootsy Collins and Les Claypool and all these people that that he loved, um, Rocco Pre uh, Prestia, uh, but we. Eventually, at that time, added Andy Hess on bass, and Andy was there for several years. And then he left the band, and then 15 years ago, we hired Jorgen Carlson, who just left the band recently. And we hired uh, this guy, Kevin Scott, who's been with us about six or seven months now and is just fantastic. He's doing a, a terrific job. Um, Government Mule was... Uh, an interesting band in the way that the bass plays such a huge role in the music. It's such a big part of the overall, overall personality. And Kevin Scott has got personality for days uh, in his plan. And he uh, loves Alan Woody's playing, but also loves Andy Hiss and, and Jorgen Carlson's playing. Uh, but he's very much his own guy. And so at this point we've, we've hit him with about 250 songs that he's had to learn. <laughs> Uh, and he's just doing an incredible job. Let me ask you, uh, you, you did uh, some time in the dead and there's been multiple guitar players that have kind of uh, rolled into that position. Kim Ock, uh, 
you know, uh, and of course, recently John Mayer from Denco for the last 13 years or so. But how did you approach the Jerry spot um, as far as guitar playing? Did you look at it as like, I'm going to give it my own thing? Or were you mixing in his, you know, I mean, I heard you play in the dead, but I'm just wondering when you're first getting ready to start it, what was your approach to that? You know, do you go out, you get the auto wall and you're ready to go, you know? Well, my situation was a, a little different in the way that my association with those guys started with Phil Lesh. Uh, I got a call from Phil Lesh in the late nineties saying that he had put together a list of musicians, quite a long list of musicians that he wanted to play with. And that I was one of those people. And, would I be interested in coming to California and doing a few rehearsals and a few shows? And I said, absolutely, I, I would love to. Um, and when I got there, uh, the thing that he told all of us was, I don't want anybody to play or sing like Jerry. I, I want everybody to bring their own personality. And, and I don't want to hear any of the signature stuff that, that he played. I want you to uh, reinterpret. And so not just myself, but uh, all the musicians at that time, he was giving the same kind of parameters to uh, because he wanted to hear other musicians interpreting that music in a different way. And, and I think he was spot on. He was exactly right. Um, so I played on and off with Phil for years and years and years, which eventually led to me uh touring with the dead uh of two different times i guess 93 and 99 or 2003 and 2009 sorry um dated myself there um <laughs> so when i got uh, the invitation to join the dead uh, it was a little different because i felt like well now i should probably pay more attention to some of the classic Jerry stuff that, that I had when I was working in Phil's band, uh, because the, that audience kind of expects some of that, you know, and, and whereas my approach the whole time I worked with Phil was to do what he was asking and just bring my personality to the table. And of course the guys in the dead, uh, were giving me all the, the freedom in the world. They're saying you do it however you want. You interpret it your own way. You can, pay as much tribute to Jerry as you you want or don't want from moment to moment, uh, which is really the same freedom that the Allman Brothers gave me when I joined the Allman Brothers in 89. You know, I remember those guys saying, you know, we hired you to be you. What, however much Dwayne Allman influence you choose to showcase is your own decision. And we're not going to ask you to play it more like Dwayne or less like Dwayne. And that's, that makes you feel at ease and i think you can be more creative when when you feel that kind of freedom yeah absolutely because then you can get some of the flavor but you can be yourself you know yeah and i could i could decide song by song or night by night how much i wanted to go down uh that road you know there are certain songs like when i was playing slide on on statesboro blues you kind of need to play it like Dwayne Allman because that's what that is. That's what that song is, you know, but then when we would play dreams or in memory of Elizabeth Reed or whipping post, sometimes the jams would go off into completely different uh, directions. And and for me, that was a lot of fun to, to, to kind of uh, do it my own way, you know? Do you feel that it is, I feel that the, uh, the jam scene and, <clears throat> excuse me, Horde and all that kind of saved some bands like the Black Crows. You know, the Black Crows kind of uh, morphed into a jam band and were able to survive uh, all this time. And I think that if they didn't get into that kind of uh, scene, they might have been left as maybe, quote unquote, an 80s band, you know? Yeah, it, it's hard to say because... You know, the Black Crows started, I guess, uh, late 80s. And a lot of the bands from that time period kind of fell by the wayside. Uh, I think they kind of always had one foot in the rock and roll world and one foot in the jam band world. 
And Government Mule is is similar. You know, uh, we're a little heavier than most jam bands. Uh, we are definitely a rock and roll band. But in order to qualify as a jam band, the, the main criteria are that you play a different set list every night and that your your music is kind of steeped in improvisation. Uh, as long as you qualify in both of those ways, uh, I think the jam band scene is open to so many different genres and styles of, of music. And I, I've been encouraging for decades now for it to be even more open-minded because I, I think the jam band scene uh, initially could have included more jazz and blues and bluegrass and, and uh, soul music and reggae music. And now all those things are kind of starting to happen. Yeah, I think if Curtis Mayfield was around right now, he'd be in the jam band scene, you know? Yeah, so that's great. I, I would love that. Same here, same here. And look at, uh, same way as Government Mule kind of has one foot in and uh, uh, Primus, same thing, you know? Yeah. They, they had a foot in there and it kind of, uh, you know, kept him going all through those those 90s. Can you give me any uh, funny memories of that Woodstock 99? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, 94, right? 94. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, um, well, the craziest thing was that when we finally got the call uh, for the Allman brothers to be part of it, uh, we had already booked that night in Boston at, uh, what they call great woods, which was an outdoor amphitheater. And the show was sold out in advance and there was no way we could cancel it. So the only way we could do Woodstock was if we went on really early in the day and played our set and then immediately flew to Boston and played uh, another show. And that's the only time uh, in my mind the, that the Allman Brothers ever did that. So we played a 90 minute set uh, around 12.30 in the afternoon at Woodstock and then immediately got on a plane and flew to Boston and played a three-hour show. And we were all joking around that the the Boston show was going to suffer. We were all going to be tired, but it turned out to be fantastic, uh, as did the Woodstock show. Um, but we were in and out so quickly. Like, uh, we, we were probably there like six or eight hours, you know, <laughs> Uh, I went to bed on the bus and woke up and we were backstage at Woodstock and I don't even know how we got there. Uh, but Alan Woody was a big Primus fan and he was telling me, we got to watch Primus, got to watch Primus, you know, and we weren't able to, to watch their show uh, in its entirety. So we were watching it on, on the TV as we were pulling away in the, in the bus. Uh, but he's the one that, that, turned me on to Primus, which was somewhere around that time. I, I don't know, 93 or 94, uh, when when Woody turned me on to Primus. And then I eventually became friends with Les, and we've collaborated together. And and, and uh, I love what he does. You know? Oh, God, he's a genius, man. Wow, that, yeah. stuff, he's, that stuff he's doing with uh, Sean Lennon right now is just mind-boggling. Yeah, I, I love that stuff. We all went to see them uh, in Austin, Texas, on a on a night off, and it was fantastic. Of course, Les and I played together many, many times, and he's one of the people that helped keep Government Mule alive too. You know, and when we couldn't decide if we were going to keep going, and we couldn't think of like who the new bass player would be, it was people like Les and Dave Schools and Mike Gordon and George Porter and uh, Jason Newstead and uh that that came out Jack Cassidy, uh Alfonso Johnson, all these people came out and did shows with us at a time when when we needed help, you know. Jason Newstead, great, great bass player, man. We had Newstead and George Porter and Greg Arzab uh all on the road at the same time. Uh, they were all on the bus with us. We would have three bass players because with with us doing a different set list every night, we didn't want to go backwards and we didn't want anybody to have to learn like a hundred songs. So we would kind of go through the songs and divide up. Okay. Porter's going to play these. 
Newstead is going to play those. Arzab is going to play those. And over the course of a three hour show, there would be three bass players. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. If you're, if you're in, if you're doing that gig, you're like, yeah, I'm up for like five songs and then I can go hit the bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was funny, but it, it was also cool. Everybody hanging together on the bus because everybody was so supportive and they're all such great musicians that they were really just keeping government mule afloat at a time when, when we were uh, struggling, you know, losing Alan Woody was a, a huge blow uh, for us. And, and I know that speaking for myself personally, I wasn't sure we could do it. I, I, I wasn't sure that, that I wanted to do it, but we got so much encouragement that we thought, well, we'll see if we can reinvent, you know, and, and start a new chapter. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did, man. Cause it's Yeah, uh, me too, man. Yeah, the mule is just it's just gold to me. I I was re-listening to it last night and uh, you know, I was just like, this stuff is incredible. Cause you know, you'll listen to something for like two, three years, and then you'll move on and listen to other stuff. And then you go back and you listen to all the music that you've made, and it's just like this guy is just mind-boggling to me, man. You know, it's it's so refreshing every time I hear it. It's it's great. Well, thanks. You know, we we're just kind of getting away with murder and doing music the way we want to do it, and somehow we've been able to build an audience of like-minded folks that that dig where we're coming from, and you know, we started. Uh, with the whole concept of just being uh, a project. So we were only going to make one record, do one tour, and then kind of go back to our lives. But it it became more than that. So as we started thinking, we'll make a second record or a third record or a fifth record or a tenth record, we wanted each of them to be different from the one before it because we're all influenced by so many different types of music. It would be a shame to not bring all that music to the forefront, given the opportunity. Let's talk a little bit about uh, equipment. I did watch your rig rundown because I've, I've always loved your tone. I've always loved uh, the one the the one Les Paul that you played all through Almond Brothers. I, I didn't really know, but it, I guess it was like hanging on the wall at Gibson with no pickups and all that. But it's amazing to think about uh, how great that guitar was, right? Because that was an era where Gibson was still, you know, they had the custom shop and stuff, but it was still a little wonky here and there. And now they're just screaming with like the Murphy Lab and all of that. Um, I loved your Les Paul. Now, uh, I guess it's a 58 reissue. Uh, my signature model is, uh, is uh, a 58 body and a 59 neck. And it uh it has burst bucker one in the the rhythm position and burst bucker two in the treble position, and it has this uh this buffer preamp with a switch that you can turn on and off that enables you to get all the treble back when you turn the guitar down really low on the volume knob, and so that offers a lot of uh tone variations beyond what would be in a normal Les Paul. And I've gotten so used to uh, playing those guitars that uh, it, they're the most comfortable for me to play. I, I know how to navigate those guitars um, more than anything. And we're also working on a, a signature Firebird and maybe another signature Les Paul. Uh, you know, I have a, a great relationship with Gibson and they, they allow me to kind of give a lot of input and explore different options. And, uh, you know, I, I've been a Gibson guy my entire life. Let me ask you something. So you're saying 58 body, but 59 neck. Isn't a 58, 59, 60 the same body and just the neck shapes are different of all three? You know, that's, that's a good question because... I'm basing it on what I remember Brian Farmer, my old guitar tech that passed away. That's the way he used to describe it because he he helped me with a lot of the, the design work and stuff. I don't know if there's a difference in the curve or not. That That's, that's something that I could easily be corrected on. But that's what Farmer used to always say. It's a 58 body and a 59 neck. 
but I could be so wrong that it's the exact same thing. <laughs> well, I know the neck shapes are all totally different. Like 58, I always liked. It was kind of baseball bat. Then yeah. 59 was kind of medium. And then 60 was too slim for me. That's the Jimmy Page, you know, Joe Walsh type of stuff, the slim down neck. But uh, yeah, that, that's my, my feeling as well. The 60 necks are too skinny for me. And, and I think it even changes the sound. But some people love that. Like Joe Bonham also really loves the 1960 Les Paul. Um, and I think there are some early 60s that still have the, the big 59 neck. Correct. Correct. Let me ask you, um, when, you when you're, I saw the uh, signature model and it looked like it was a plain top. Was that a choice of yours? Because yours is heavily flamed. Yeah, we, we talked about doing a plain top in the beginning and then possibly doing a flame top uh, later on. Um, it was just something that they got batted around that uh, seemed to be the preference. You know, uh, I've really become fond of the plain tops, uh, although my, my real 59 is a, a beautiful burst, you know. Oh, wow, you got a real 59. When did you get that? Uh, I guess I got it in the 90s uh no uh in the 2000s i've had it I've, I've had it about god it's probably 15 years now i i'm having trouble with decades today for some reason oh, i get it i get it dude i'm only 57 and i can't even remember what somebody goes what happened in 96 i go i have no idea <laughs> 18, 1896 i don't know <laughs> Where did you get it? Uh, where? Yeah. Uh, from my friend uh, Ronnie Proler in, in Texas. He's a, a collector. And uh, it, it's just a, a gorgeous instrument. It, it was named Maddie before I got it. So I still call it Maddie. Uh, I'm not the one that named it. But it, it's it's beautiful. A uh, farmer used to say that it has the best bass pickup that he had had heard and I, I'm I'm you know I'm sure that's an exaggeration but it, it's such a beautiful sounding instrument and I played it a lot uh in the final beacon shows oh, wow. um and, and I played it a lot in the studio but I I'm just I don't want to bring it too far from home you know oh I get it I get it were you looking for one for years and then this happened to be the right one or did you finally have the money like, okay, I'm going to buy one. What was that story? It was kind of all the above. You know, when I joined the Allman brothers in 89, uh, I remember somebody had a 59 that they wanted to sell me for $15,000. And I was like, I will never pay $15,000 for a guitar. Are you crazy? And now you look back and go, wow, I could have gotten a, a 59 Les Paul for $15,000. Yeah. Um, you know, it, my whole life was like that. Well, I'd love to have one, but it sure is a lot of money. And, you know, Ronnie's been such a, a great friend through the years and, and helped me uh, uh, find the right one. And uh, it just, just kind of all worked out. And, I looked at a lot. I, I I played probably 30 or 40 of them, you know. Uh, I'm really happy with the one that I wound up with, but I don't see myself as one of those people that'll continue down that, that road, you know. Yeah, not not Bonamassa style. I went to right. the city, just had a, it's just basically like a, a music store in 1965. <laughs> yeah, they go in there. Yeah, you know, I I sat in with Joe recently at Red Rocks, and uh, played one of his 59s, or I think it was a 58. Uh, you know that he had on the road with him, and and you know they're all fantastic, but I just don't trust myself to uh, carry them. You know. Yeah. What about amps? I know you were a Diaz guy for a while and then Soldano, and now you're using those Homesteads, I believe. Um, yeah, Homestead, Homestead is a continuation of Diaz. Right. Uh, Cesar Diaz uh, passed away years ago, and he had made me a bunch of one-of-a-kind amps that I really loved. 
And this guy, uh, Peter McMahon, that was working with Caesar, took over the company and, and continued it as Diaz for a while, but eventually started uh, Homestead, which I, I really like a lot. Uh, I'm still using my uh, modified Soldanos, which Mike Soldano mo modified for me years ago. Um, they sound com completely different than a stock SLO 100. Um, so it's kind of like the Soldano is my marshal and the, and the Homestead is my fender uh, in a way, but they, they both have their own unique voices. But I've been recording with a lot of old marshals and stuff recently too. I might even start using one of them live because the, the Soldano is uh, more of the sound on the first three records. Uh, I used it almost exclusively back then. But since then, I've used more and more different amps. And so I want to do more experimenting uh, for the, the, the live future, so to speak. And what era, uh, Marshalls? It's like JMPs, Plexis, 50 watts, 100 watts? Yeah, uh, I have a good 50 watt, a good 100 watt. There's uh, They vary from 69 to like 73. And... Uh, I have this 100 watt that's so damn loud that I got from uh, Gordy Johnson of, of Big Sugar. Uh, it's the loudest 100 watt I've ever heard. I, when we went in the studio, I had to uh, take two of the tubes out and make it like the 50 watt version just because I didn't couldn't stand in the same room with it. Um, but it sounds in incredible, you know. And for the last uh, for Government Mule record for Peace Like a River, I used some of my old Marshalls and I used uh, uh, a Vox AC30. Oh, and, and then, but for the blues record, when we did heavy load blues, it was all small vintage amps, you know, like a Supro and a, uh, a Gibson Skylark and a Gibson Vanguard. Uh, I also have this little Alessandro recording amp that I use all the time. Sometimes I use it by itself. But sometimes I blend it in with like the 100 watt or 50 watt uh, combo, you know, like a head cabinet combination. And it just has this beautiful mid range that that fills out the picture in a way that I really love. Were you ever uh, did you ever come across the Dumble? Have you ever owned a Dumble? Uh, he recently passed away, but uh, I know that uh, quite a few people have him. John Mayer, uh, Bonamassa, a lot of guys out there playing Dumble. You know. I actually never, not only never owned one, I've never plugged into one. I've had a lot of opportunities and, and thought about it. Uh, I guess I just didn't want to fall in love with a $200,000 amp. But, uh, you know, I spoke to him uh, when I was living in Nashville in, in the 80s. We, we had a phone conversation and it was kind of like the conversation we just had about 59 less Pauls back then. He was like, well, I can build you one for, I think it was 15 grand or something. And uh, there's an 18 month waiting list. If you want it in six months, it's another 10 grand or, or whatever it was. And I was just like, wow, this is crazy. Uh, um, but now you look at those things and it's like buying a Maserati or something, you know? Yeah. 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 Speaking of that, are but, you a, are you a car guy? Not not really. My wife is more in, into cars than I am. Uh, I I I'm one of those people that, believe it or not, would prefer to be the passenger. <laughs> <laughs> what about any other collection stuff like watches or anything uh, other than guitars and amps? <laughs> not really. Uh, you know, I I have. Uh, a few pieces of old sports memorabilia that I've accrued through the years, but not because I'm a fanatic, just because the situation came up and, and it was uh, available, you know, but uh, guitars, I, I even never thought of myself as a guitar collector. I used to make fun of Alan Woody because uh, he had, he had over 500 instruments between oh. basses and guitars and mandolins and all that stuff. Um, and I used to give him so much shit about it. And now I probably got somewhere between 250 and 300. So it, it, 
I feel like such a hypocrite. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. I did watch the rig rundown, and uh, I love the Firebirds. Dead Bird uh, was cool, but the one with the P90s, that guitar sounded fantastic. I'm a huge P90 guy. So when you plug that one in, I was like, oh, my God, the tone of that was fantastic. Well, that's one of the things we're working on now is a, a signature Firebird with three P90s. And uh, I have one that, that Gibson uh, gave me years ago that was like a prototype. And back then, I... I I was scared of the third pickup because it was always in the way. Uh, but once you get used to that, the, the the tone possibilities is so crazy. And the P90s sound great. There's something about that combination of Firebird with P90s that is a really unique and special sound. Yeah, I love it. The mahogany body with the P90s. To me, you know, Leslie West uh, with the, you know, the juniors and, and Santana Woodstock, that sound is just so great, man. Yeah, it's it's fierce, ferocious. Uh, it's we're also working on a, a P ninety Les Paul. Wow, which I'm excited about. I love uh, that you play the regular Firebird and not the reverse Firebird, right? That would that's the bodies you play, or is it the the other way around? I can't ever remember. Well, I think the traditional Firebird is reverse and uh, the non-traditional is non-reverse. Right. So it, it, it's very confusing. But yeah. I, I have I have some of both. You know, I think the non-reverses stay in tune better and, and in some ways play better. Uh, I have a, a 64 uh, traditional Firebird with the, the two pickups. It was, uh, was that the... What is that? Firebird 3? Oh, Firebird 3. Uh, I have a 64 that sounds fantastic, but I, I don't I don't carry it on the road. And I also have this purple custom paint job uh, that Alan Woody talked me into putting banjo tuners, real banjo tuners on. And it does make it sound better. There's something about it that affects the sound. Uh, it's it's hard to keep in tune or hard to get in, in tune, uh, but it's worth it once you do get in tune. It, it's just, it sounds really great. That's the guitar that I played on like Endless Parade on on High and Mighty. Uh, Farmer dubbed it Barney. He called it Barney because it was purple, but that's a, a beautiful sounding guitar as well. Um, Firebirds for me were the the opportunity to get a little closer to a Fender, but still have the Gibson meet. Right? Did you ever play Fender? Because I'm such a huge Blackguard, you know, Esquire fan, and those are just like just dirty blue collar rock machines. Did you never did you not get into that? Huh? I did in the '80s. I had this great uh, red Stratocaster that I played as my main guitar for several years. And it got stolen uh, in New York City in uh, the early 90s. And I never replaced it. And uh, it was kind of coinciding with the time period when I had just joined the Allman Brothers in 89 and I was playing Les Paul more and more and the Strat less and less. But there are uh, a lot of uh, a lot of video footage from the early, from 89 and early 90s where I even was playing that Strat in the Allman Brothers, which was uh, me trying to, to bring a different sound into that band uh, at the time. And I, I missed that guitar, but I never had replaced it. I, I love hearing other people play Fenders, but I'm not as good at it, uh, I, I guess, because I, you know, I grew up on Gibsons. Yeah, the Strat especially, man. It's hard to hard to sound good on. I mean, you it exposes mistakes, you know, it's, a, it's the yeah. exposure. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I guess if that's what you're used to, uh, people that, that grew up playing Stratocasters aren't as comfortable on a, a Les Paul or an SG or something. Yeah, that's true. Now let's talk a little bit about the Christmas jam. Um, you've got the, uh, it's coming up what on the December 8th or 9th that that's coming up. December 9th, uh, 
in Asheville, North Carolina, which is my my hometown. And and you started this thirty years ago, right? Started it in nineteen eighty eight in a, a little club that it was has been gone for decades. Um, it started as a local event with all local musicians in, in 1988. I had not even joined the Allman brothers yet. Uh, we started it uh, as a reason and an opportunity for the local musicians that were all friends to get together and jam. And at the only time of the year that we were all home because everybody traveled. Uh, and so the, during the Christmas holidays, we would all be home. So we would get together and, and jam and, you know, raise a few thousand dollars and pick a charity and donate the money. Uh, the first year uh, was cool. So we did it the second year. It was even better. Third year, even better. By the time we got to like the fourth year, we were turning people away. We had to move to a theater. After three years in the theater, we were turning people away. So we had to move to the arena. And so it's been in the arena now close to 30 years uh uh, it, I, it was one of those things I never could have predicted would have kept going, but uh, it's just turned into this beautiful event where people come and play music for all the right reasons. It reminds us all why we started playing music in the first place. Yeah, and you have this uh, 20th, uh, volume 20 coming out. I believe it's going to be on vinyl, but Gold Dust Woman is out right now with Jim James and you, and uh, God, I love Jim James. That sounds amazing, man, when you guys are singing and, and just that perfect, perfect tune to hear you like really shine on. It's a great cut. Well, it's it's uh, myself and Grace Potter and Jim James, just the three of us on the little side stage uh, playing acoustically during one of the set breaks. We have this little side stage set up where anybody that wants to can can go you're playing to the same audience it's all part of the the one big stage but uh while bands are changing over people go over there and do little impromptu performances uh dave grohl did one as well he did everlong and he and i did times like these together on the little side stage uh bonamassa and myself did uh, if heartaches were nickels on that little stage but most of the stuff is from the the main stage um but there's so much impromptu music that happens. And that's one of the things that I love about it. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing, man. And like I said, uh, I can't wait for people to see this Dave Grohl thing play because it it really blew my mind. And uh, it was shot well, too, man. Is the whole concert coming out on video? Yeah, it, it's not the entire thing, but it's two Blu-rays worth of uh, footage and three CDs. Um, the show is usually like seven or eight hours long, so we wow. can't put the whole thing out. But there's hours and hours of fantastic stuff that that's available, and all the the proceeds go to to charity. You know, from the the DVDs and the videos and the the, the CDs and the vinyl. Yeah, there is vinyl, um, and. We're gradually trying to, you know, the, the, we've done so many of them. We're trying to go through and pick the best stuff and release as many as possible. But that's the one that's that's coming out now. And it's really fantastic. Uh, Jim James, Grace Potter, uh, Mike Gordon, um, Eric Church, uh, uh, of course, Government Mule. And we, we did some stuff where Dave Grohl sat in with Government Mule. Uh, we did a cool version of Rockin' in the Free World that segues into Machine Gun and back into Rockin' in the Free World. Um, I encourage music lovers to check it out because the, the music's fantastic. 100%. 100%. A couple more questions, then we'll get out of here. Um, I just recently did a couple venues in New York that you've done over the years. One Beacon and the other one Madison Square Garden. Uh, tell me what the beacon means to you, and then tell me about that 50-year anniversary of the almonds at the garden. Well, the beacon uh, is my home away from home. That's the place I've played more than any other venue. Uh, and maybe, I think I might be the person that's played there 
more than anybody else. I, I've played there close to 300 times. Wow. And, I, you know, we did. We used to do with the Allman Brothers. We used to play every year. We started out the first year that we did it was four shows. And I think the most that the band ever did was 19. Um, but Government Mule does multiple shows there. I did a lot of stuff with, uh, with Phil Lesh there. And I've sat in with the Black Crows and Widespread Panic and, and so many people there through the years. Uh, wonderful venue. I really love it. Uh, the 50th at the Garden with the Brothers was fantastic on so many levels. Uh, the, the music was great. I was so proud of us. The, uh, the, the lineup that we put together for that show was incredible. And everybody just did a, an amazing job. It was Chuck Lavelle on piano, uh, Reese Winans on organ, um, myself and Derek Trucks and O'Teal Burbridge and Mark Quinones from the the last edition of the Allman Brothers and Derek's brother Dwayne uh, playing drums along with J-Mo. Um, it was amazing, but it was also surreal because it was the night before COVID took over the world. Right. A lot, a lot of people got sick that night, and up until the up until showtime, we weren't sure if we were going to even play, because that was the day when everything was going crazy, and they kept saying we might have to cancel the show. We wound up doing the show; it was fantastic, and then the next day, everything went away. Yeah, I did a Bon Scott tribute that night. I do it once a year with all these uh, celebrities and, and comedians and big musicians. Same night. That's why I didn't go to the Allman Brothers thing, because I was like, oh, damn, I got a gig. And it was the same thing. People were calling me and texting and going, hey, is it going to be canceled? Because uh, and I was like, you know, I'd been around. I worked for the Stones when SARS hit. And that was like two weeks. So I was like, no, it's not going to be canceled. We'll be fine. And same thing. The next day, the whole the whole city shut down. It was over. Yeah, it, it was crazy. Um, and a lot of people we knew that were all sitting in a similar area uh, got sick that night, which was just, it was just surreal thinking back on it. Uh, I'm glad we recorded it and filmed it and were able to release it because that's that's a one-time thing you know yeah absolutely well hey man congrats on everything and uh like i said it's been an honor to talk to you I, i've been a fan for a zillion years and i absolutely love your playing and your singing and your songwriting and uh you know i'm hoping to see you in february when you're out here i'm a comedian so I'm on the road a lot these days. I yeah. used to play music, but now I'm a comedian. But man, I hope I can see you in February. Before we go, do you watch comedy? Are you into comedy? Huge. I'm a huge comedy guy. Really? So who, who you into? Well, I mean, it, it's it's cliche at this point, but I've been a Bill Hicks fan since like oh. I don't even know how how far to go back. You know, uh, and, and I, I go back to George Carlin, Richard Pryor. You know, when I was a kid, I had Class Clown on vinyl. Yeah. Uh, we had the, all the, the Richard Pryor stuff uh, on cassette tape. You know, I, I've been a comedy fan all my life. Uh, where do you live, Nashville? No, I, I live uh, in Westchester, New York. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Well, you know, maybe one day uh, we'll see each other and uh, you can come see some comedy or I'll, hopefully I'll get to see you in February and that sounds uh, great I, I would love that it'd be great man thank you so much and uh get my info from uh your publicist and uh stay in touch please man big Absolutely. fan great to Absolutely. talk to you and congrats on this uh this christmas jam i can't wait for people to see this two dvd set because it is fire thanks man thank you buddy all right dude i'll see you